this panel is uh, on MDLs and technology. It's uh, going to be organized a little bit differently from the others uh, uh, in, in the sense that um, it's not, I mean, except for the fact that we're talking about MDLs and technology, uh, there's not a sort of a unifying theme to uh, uh, each, each of the panelists is going to talk from their own experience about how, uh, how uh, technology has affected uh, or could affect uh, the MDL. And uh, I'll just say a brief word uh, about each of them so that when we get into the discussion, uh, we can just uh, go uh, right into it. So, let's see. Um, just in alphabetical orders, uh, uh, Zach uh, Clopton, who's sitting right here. Um, no, I, I missed Elizabeth Cabreza, right? Elizabeth Cabreza, the A comes before the L. Sorry. Uh, yeah, east of the Rockies, it does. It does. <laughs> First order. And, and west of the Rockies, where does it come? Wherever you like. Okay. Uh, I would say that uh, Elizabeth arguably is the most significant member of the plaintiff's bar in complex litigation cases. Uh, and she and her firm have been involved in, you know, numerous uh, high profile MDLs and class actions. She's also a very dedicated member of our board, for which we, uh, we thank her. Uh, and uh, she, you know, was here and talk, I hope we'll talk a little about uh, how technology has allowed uh, the plaintiffs to be more involved in the litigation uh, process. Uh, Zach uh, Clopton is a professor at uh, Cornell and is one of the leading young proceduralists in the United States. And he's been published among many other places in the NYU Law Review and in the Chicago Law Review. And uh, he is going to be talking about the use of data analysis to do academic analysis of uh, academic research in the MDL. Uh, Emery Lee is the senior research fellow at the Federal Judicial Center. I would say he knows more about the data behind uh, the federal judiciary uh, than just about anybody in the country and the world. And he has uh, researched and written countless papers on the use of technology and data. And ha Harry Rishikoff, he's now at Temple uh, Law School. He formerly was the dean of the faculty of the National War College, former legal counsel to the deputy director of the FBI, and he is uh, a, an expert on national security law and cybersecurity, and I hope he'll say a few words about the sec security concerns uh, in MDL uh, cases. Uh, I, uh, for those of you uh, who were not here yesterday, I would like to introduce myself. And for those of you who were, to reintroduce myself. Uh, I'm Peter Zimroth, and I am the director of the Center on Civil Justice. I have to say a few words about that because I, I am very proud uh, that I was asked to lead the effort to create uh, this center with my co and to work with my co-directors, who uh, some of whom are here, uh, and also Sheila Birnbaum, uh, who was here and I think she'll be back in a minute, uh, who and Sam Asakra, Sheila and Sam really were the driving forces for the creation of, of this. And uh, I was very pleased that they asked me to be the director. Um, now, I'm also, I, I, I say this, that the, the work that we're doing here personally for me is uh, very uh, fulfilling and enriching and also uh, sanity producing in, in many ways. You may not think that you spend your whole lives 
uh, doing it. But for me, uh, as some of you know, I am the monitor of the New York City Police Department, mm -hmm. uh, and it is really very uh, good to, to see and to work on problems that in this context here in the Civil Justice Center that affect so many people in so many important ways but do not involve, you know, the emotional issues of police confronting citizens on the street, which is uh, also obviously very important, but the work that is being done here and the work of the MDL is, affects millions and millions of people and I'm very happy to be involved uh, with it. One of the goals of the center is to generate conversations that, so, that we, can, we hope will lead to further conversations and uh, further projects uh, by, uh, by the center. Uh, and I want to give you just uh, one or two examples, and then I want to talk about a current example which is directly related to, the, to, to this conference. Um, we had a conference on third-party litigation funding, and uh, which led to the creation of an online li library uh, that am amasses together resources that are not easily uh, accessible to uh, lawyers, judges, and the public uh, about th that growing industry. Uh, it doesn't exist anywhere in the world, and we're about to launch that uh, very soon. If you would like to uh, take a look at it, uh, you can see the prototype of it on our website. Uh, which is centeronciviljustice.org. It's a very exciting project, we're, uh, and it'll be up and running uh, soon. But you can see the prototype now. Uh, closer to home, uh, some years ago, we did a conference on consumer class actions. And that led to a project that we call our aggregate litigation data project. Uh, at, the, at that conference, there were wonderful people, and they were arguing about the pros and cons of consumer class actions. They work, they don't work, they're good, they're bad, and it became apparent to everybody, including the people who were making the arguments, that their arguments were based on war stories. Who has the most interesting war story <laughs> about their case? And not on data, and, um, and, and, and then it became apparent at that conference and elsewhere, things that I'm sure a lot of you people here know, that there is in fact an enormous amount of data about, uh, that is collected in each aggregate litigation case, but it's not made available uh, to researchers, to, to, uh, uh, to anybody other than the immediate participants in that case. And we heard here uh, yesterday that even, uh, even the, um, the, uh, ju some judges don't really have a grasp on all the things that are happening in, the, in their MDL. I think uh, it was Judge uh, um, who, uh, who, talked, who, who said that he felt like he was in uh, Plato's cave. And uh, he could see the shadow on the wall, but didn't really know what was behind the shadow, which I thought was a really uh, important uh, insight and clearly true. So our project is hopefully, if it's successful, will make these data more publicly available. 
And, uh, and I, when I'm talking about the data, I'm talking about not only the, uh, the data that is put on the ECF with, um, uh, on PDFs, which are already difficult enough to find if, unless you actually know where to look. Uh, but what's behind that, that data? The, we know that, that the claims administrators collect an enormous amount of data that would be very useful if it was made more available. And I, I want to be clear that I'm not talking about data that, uh, um, that reveals the personal identity of claimants. Nobody wants that. We don't want that. We want to make sure that all that data is uh, anonymous. And it's easy to do. It's very easy to do. Um, so we went and, and, and talked to the claims administrators and to ask them whether they would supply us with data. And uniformly, they said no. Uh, and they all said that um, there were confidentiality concerns. They weren't talking about the confidentiality concerns, or at least they were, they were, they were persuaded that, they, that since we were going to uh, make the data anonymous to wash out uh, uh, identifying information, that's not the, what they were talking about. They were saying that they have confidentiality agreements with their clients, banks, whomever, and that they could not um, reveal that unless there was uh, some protection that they had from a court. Obviously, if a court ordered them to produce it, they would uh, produce it. And some of them said that would be fine with them, but they needed that. Um, we, we spoke to many judges. I think it's very clear that there does not have to be a rule change. Uh, this is something that the judge already has within his or her power to order. Um, and so we, we are now looking for uh, partners in the judiciary who would help us on a, on a pilot basis accomplish what we wanted to do it. As we envision it, a pilot would involve three components. First, constructing spreadsheets that, 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 uh, of data that uh, the judges would feel comfortable in ordering um, claims administrators to fill out and supply to a neutral third party. That's us. I think we are, uh, nobody questions that we are neutral. We don't have an ax to grind. We're not pro-plaintiff. We're not pro-defendant. Our only goal here is to make the data uh, available. Um, second, once enough data is, has been compiled, we would then provide a free tool to the judges so that they can visualize this data in useful uh, ways uh, and compare it, compare the data to cases before the judge, uh, helping, we hope, uh, the judge to make better decisions. And third, uh, we would incorporate the lessons learned from this pilot to see, well, was it worth it? Was it not worth it? And if it was, uh, to, to try to persuade other judges to, uh, uh, to do the same thing. So I wanted to uh, show you a, 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 a mock-up of what it is that we have in mind. This is, uh, I have to thank uh, both Sam and David Siffert here who uh, were largely responsible for these uh, uh, slides. So. Uh, we'll make these slides available to whomever uh, wants them. They'll, they'll be available when we publish the, the proceedings here, but we will 
um, uh, but we'll make it available sooner if anyone uh, wants it. Okay, so uh, the first thing you see on the screen is we would ask the judge, well, what is it uh, that the decision, what's the decision that's facing you? And I mean, here we have uh, only three, right? I mean, obviously there are many, many more decisions that face the judge uh, and th they'll all be included. But here we have, uh, you know, is, is this uh, matter in the, in the stage of approving a settlement, a proposed settlement, uh, or are you trying to uh, decide to approve or disapprove uh, attorney's fees or approve a notice program? So then that would be uh, uh, clicked, and then they, they would uh, put in the, uh, the case, the name of the case, and uh, we use as a first example, we're at the stage of the settlement approval, so that's the name of the case, the Acme Toy uh, case, and this is what a screen could look like. I want to emphasize that once we, we start this, there may be many other ways of displaying this information that judges would find more useful, and we easily can, can change it once we have the data. But here you can see what uh, can be gleaned from existing data. Now, we put some data in here, uh, and we did that uh, based on mock data that was supplied to us by one of the claims administrators with whom we had spoken, uh, the Brown Greer firm, I don't know, you may know it, uh, and they were very helpful in, in helping us here, and they put in some mock data. So uh, this, uh, anyway. Uh, so, so this is a proposed settlement of $175 million. You can see that on the screen, and it's a visualization of the breakdown uh, of the proposed se settlement. How much uh, goes to the class, to the lawyers, to the administrators, and how much is left over. Um, On the top left, you, you can see, um, yeah, on the top left you can see uh, the average percentages in the total values from what our algorithm deems to be similar cases. Now this is a big challenge for us. We're in the process of, of, of creating an algorithm. And there are many different ways that you can do that, what counts as a similar case. Uh, whenever we uh, go live on this or uh, we will make whatever that algorithm is publicly available. All the codes, uh, the data that went into it so that if uh, the judge or whoever else is using this uh, wants to make uh, changes, well they ca can't change our algorithm but they can, they can do other things. They can reject certain aspects and accept other aspects. Anyway, on the top right you can see the breakdown uh, of what is deemed to be the most similar case, and below that in the second row, uh, the, cir the four circular uh, the charts um, are the numbers, uh, what, what the parties are claiming in this case uh, will happen. The pie charts, those pie charts can com be compared uh, to, the, to the two pie charts above so that the judge can understand whether the distributions are in line or not in line uh, from uh, prior settlements. And the bell curve below shows how far the proposed settlement deviates from the average settlements. So uh, this slide is, illustrates uh, that there will be tools that the judge or any other user can, can use to screen. If they don't like what our algorithm produced, they can screen further. 
only cases with more than X defendants uh, or more than X plaintiffs, etc. cetera. Uh, then this is slide six. We'll be able to visualize what the parties claim the distribution will be um, with the actual, the actual distribution in similar cases. Uh, and we can also compare those numbers against the damages that had been, complaint, uh, had been in the uh, complaint and the answer. Uh, th those are just some of the things that can be, you can do at that stage. Now, so this, I'm uh, moving now to a different stage of the litigation. Actually, it's a, probably a prior stage of the litigation, uh, the approval of the notice program. Um, so you can look and see how cost effective the notice program is. You can see the number, how many claimants, the number of claimants that actually receive checks and the total recovery by class members, and you can see that they vary with the cost of the, uh, of the notice program. And thus, you can make a judgment, or the judge can make a, a judgment about whether the money proposed for the notice program uh, will get a good bang for the buck, which seems to me to be a, 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 an important point at that stage. And I, I think you'll notice if you look carefully at the chart, that we're not using data that some claims administrators, we're not proposing to use data that some claims uh, administrators propose to use, uh, such as the cost per click, uh, because th that's so easily uh, manipulated. Uh, and so we're focused on non-fraudulent signups and overall recovery. And then, uh, this sh shows what the parties say in their proposal to the, to the court, uh, various methods will produce. As, you, as I'm sure you know, uh, often uh, the judge will, uh, the claims administrator or the, or the lawyers uh, will say, okay, uh, we want to use so much in, uh, mail and email and Twitter and whatever, and this is what we, we think it's going to uh, produce. So we can compare those with what those methods were in similar cases uh, and, and what they produced in those similar cases. So we also uh, want to make it sure it's easy to keep this database up to date. So we are creating a standard set of templates for different kinds of cases. And this is where we really need a, a, a lot of help because um, I said we had a help from Brown Greer and some others who told us the kind of information that they collect and, and helped us create uh, a, uh, a template for mass tort cases. But we know that those are, that's not, those are not the same as an antitrust case or a security case or many, many other kinds of cases, and we really need help uh, with uh, either from lawyers or from claims administrators to uh, help us create, uh, help, help us create other uh, templates. So this is a screen that just shows that they can upload, uh, makes it easy for the claims administrator or the lawyer to just upload their uh, data, assuming it's ordered and, uh, by, a, by a court, right into the database. And then also we want to make sure that they can download data. In other words, that they can download basically all of the data that's in our database so that it can be used uh, by them. Okay, and so this is the next two slides. These two slides are uh, a template that uh, we, we currently have in mind for uh, mass tort cases and you can see all the information. And this is what we learned from the claims administrators that they, uh, that they collect. And by the way, they collect way, way more than just what's in these two uh, uh, templates. And our template is likely to be 
more than just what you see here. So uh, that's, uh, that's, our, uh, that's our project. We're, uh, we're very excited about it. I think it could be a, a game changer if it is successful. We need a lot of help uh, from judges and lawyers to get this, uh, to get this going. So with that, uh, I would like to uh, turn to the other members of the uh, panel. Maybe uh, we can start with uh, Elizabeth and uh, tell us your information. By the way, there'll be time for questions afterwards, so if anyone has questions about this, I'll be happy to answer it. But I would like to uh, hear from the other panelists first, and then we can go for questions. So, Elizabeth? Sure. And I'd like to focus uh, my remarks on the ways in which uh, evolving technology has assisted in uh, the crucial function of communications with clients and class members uh, in MDLs. Uh, but first, uh, a technological historical note um, with respect to the chart from yesterday where you saw that boom uh, in MDLs uh, in the early to mid-90s. Uh, I want you to try to visualize in your mind, if you can, that remarkable piece of technology, the fax machine. You can remember what those looked like uh, and what those did. Uh, as a participant in MDLs at the time, I can tell you that that piece of technology was a total game changer because for the first time, uh, folks on the plaintiff's side could actually coordinate their briefs and complaints in real time. We could trade documents. We typically did it overnight. We could mark up documents. We could come up with unified briefs. We could come up with master complaints. And we could trade discovery documents for the first time. Uh, it used to be that MDLs went where the documents and witnesses were. And a big function uh, on the plaintiff side in an MDL was a custodianship of a physical document depository where the documents produced in discovery would be lodged and people would come and look at them and maybe make uh, some paper copies and there would be a librarian and they would be checked in, in and out. And so uh, the humble uh, fax machine uh, transformed that. Uh, it doesn't get enough credit. Uh, you know, this is a, it's a function of my, my age that I tend to think of that as the epitome of Western civilization. Um, uh, it had a brief golden age, uh, but at one time, uh, it would be typical in a plaintiff's firm uh, to see a daisy chain of 30 fax machines uh, in what had formerly been the mailroom, and that was uh, the instrumentality uh, of interstate commerce uh, that we used. And it, it, is, not, it is not that, that uh, factoid of the boom in MDLs is not coincidental. It enabled us to do it uh, without traveling, uh, it enabled us to do it more cost effectively. Um, and I like to think that as technology has evolved, um, that, that lawyers have continued to use it to improve uh, you know, the cost of effectiveness, the efficiencies of complex litigation uh, and communications with clients. But sometimes it takes a throwback, and I'll just give you one brief illustration. Um, after uh, computers, the internet, smartphones uh, enabled us to conduct a discovery and to review electronically stored information from any location. Uh, MDL practice changed again. Uh, the panel began to focus almost exclusively on the identity of the transferee judge. It didn't matter where that judge was, except for Alaska. No MDLs have gone to Alaska. Uh, <laughs> but anywhere else, uh, the, 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 the presence of a good pro-case management activist, you know, energetic judge of any political stripe appointed by any president, that became the gold standard for a successful MDL because the documents were no longer documents. They were electronically stored information. They could be anywhere. Depositions could be taken telephonically. They could be taken uh, by video. You could Skype. Uh, and so geography became uh, uh, a lesser uh, concern. Um, but one of the most effective and most efficient and most cost efficient uh, largest MDLs took place you know, between 2010 
uh, in, in 2016. Those were the more, most active uh, years. That was the Deepwater Horizon uh, BP litigation uh, that Luther uh, spoke of. And the way that worked was the old-fashioned way. Uh, the PSC was required to be physically present in New Orleans. We leased a physical office. Um, all of the computer terminals, all of the, the discovery hub was physically in New Orleans and people had to go and live and work together basically in one big room. And we coordinated with the governmental plaintiffs as well to do that. So on the one hand, people won't mind, whined and moaned, you know, why do we have to move to New Orleans? I think there are tougher things in life to do, but why do we have to disrupt our practices, give up our other cases, go there and be there and do nothing but that case, you know, in the physical view, we were, we were in eyesight of the federal court um, and, and, and the judge knew where we were, the magistrate judge knew where we were. Why did we do that? It enabled us to take 421 depositions within a year. It enabled us to become trial ready within a year. It enabled us to simultaneously negotiate and bring for approval a major class action settlement. And, and so sometimes combinations of the best, newest technology, and we had the multi-screen computers and we had wonderful programs and databases, and good old fashioned in-person collaboration are necessary to get something done. And I think uh, MDLs have been most successful when judges and lawyers have been innovated, innovative in using new technology and new techniques, but in remembering that the goal of all of this is, is communication. Uh, and so w what I have tried to do in terms of uh, the consumer class action work of improving class member participation uh, in consumer cases uh, is, to fo is to try to focus on communication, both the, me the, the means of communication, but more importantly, the content of communication. Um, one of the things that we noticed uh, in the early 90s when we were doing the breast implant uh, MDL, <coughs> this was when the internet was first coming into use. Our transferee judge, Judge Pointer, was an early adopter, and he was ahead of us because he had his own computer. So we quickly all went out and bought our own computers <laughs> and carried them around. Even if we didn't know how to use them, we would open them up you know, in the courtroom because it's like, hey, we're high tech. Um, <laughs> but what Judge Pointer knew and what we, we quickly learned was that our clients, uh, the women who had breast implants, were online. And they were online in chat rooms. And they were talking to each other and they were getting together virtually, and they were sharing information, and they were asking for information from us. They asked for information from Judge Pointer, so he got on the chat rooms. So all of a sudden, now as lawyers, we realize there's something going on here. And the paradox was, in that case, the lawyers were fighting tooth and nail over whether this should be a mass tort made up of individual uh, a personal injury and wrongful death cases or a class action. Well, guess what? The lawyers were fighting. The clients weren't. They considered themselves to be a group. So that when the case was settled as a class action, it resonated perfectly with how the women saw their own cases. This was a natural class. It was a cohesive group. And they weren't following the lead of lawyers. They were really doing this in spite of lawyers. That was a tremendous lesson to us. It's not that every case is the same and every case should be a class action, but the lesson is you have to pay attention to what the plaintiffs, what the litigants, what the clients, what the class members are saying, who they are, what they are thinking, because you have to define a class objectively, but you can't as a lawyer define who, is in, who, who a class is and what a class wants. You have to listen, you have to communicate. That was the secret of what we were able to accomplish in the Volkswagen case that you've heard about because we used every method of, of communication that we possibly could, every technological method we could, but the focus was on the message because we had to get some people to do something that was very, it was lucrative for them to do it, but it was inconvenient, it was hard, it was bring your car that you like uh, into a dealer and sell it back and give it up because it's been polluting 
And you've got two choices. You can bring it back and sell it back, or you could bring it back and get it fixed. Okay, that's nice. There was a nice financial incentive to do that, but guess what? Who wants to go to a car dealer if they don't have to, right? Uh, so we had to set up a system to incentivize people to do that, to w talk them through and walk them through the process. Um, we used, uh, we used uh, online communications. We used social media. We had a 1-800 number. We had a group of uh, lawyers from the PSC who staffed a hotline, basically 24 hours a day. We had the settlement hotline. Um, if class members didn't like what they heard on the Volkswagen hotline, they could call class council assistance. We actually had t-shirts made saying 24-hour roadside assistance because that's what we did. If people had to be helped at the dealership, you know, because they had disabilities or language issues, we did that. Um, we did it for 400,000 class members. We did it because we were required to get 85% participation by the class in the program in order for it to work. Uh, we're now up to 93% participation and the program for two liter cars ends at the end of the year. 367, 455 people have had their cars bought back as of yesterday and 61,163 of them have had their vehicles repaired as of yesterday. The numbers change daily, we track them daily, they are reported into the court, into Judge Breyer on a, a monthly basis and they are posted on the court's website. And that's the other secret. It used to be class notice was very expensive. It had to be done by mail. It would maybe happen once or twice in a case, once when the class was certified, once when it was settled, sometimes only once if the class was certified and settled at the same time. And until then, nobody knew their case had been going on. Now, at the outset of a case, particularly a case that's centralized as an MDL, the judge can set up an official website uh, as part of uh, that court's website and post everything that's happening in the case, orders, briefs, scheduling. Judge Barbier did that in Deepwater Horizon. Judge Breyer did it in Volkswagen. Uh, it's being done in the GM ignition case. Sometimes the court can do it uh, because it's got the expertise and the resources. Sometimes it tasks the lawyers to do it, but it can be done in every case and it's becoming a new standard because this way everyone in the class or in the plaintiff group can know exactly what's going on in their case they know who their lawyers are, they can ask questions, and by the time there's a decision for them to make about a settlement, for example, they have information. They've got a tremendous <clears throat> storehouse of information, and the questions they ask can be informed, and it then becomes more efficient for lawyers to communicate with them. Um, settlements to work require people to do things in the real world in real time. Settlements are not theoretical. I think the big lesson in the consumer field is it's fine and dandy to have a settlement with a $50 million fund and people have claim forms. That's not the end of the process. It's the beginning of the process. So Elizabeth, can I uh, ask you this? With all of the publicity that we're now, this comes to my mind when you talked about chat rooms, right? Mm -hmm. uh, all the publicity that we have now about um, uh, security, uh, hacking, uh, and also not just hacking, but but people uh, phony entrance into the, you know into the discussion. Were you worried about that? And if so, I, I know uh, Harvey is going to talk a little bit about that later. But I'm curious to know whether those thoughts were in your mind at the time. I, I'm sure they would be today. Well. Um I would never accuse the late, great Sam C. Pointer Jr. of hacking into women's online chat rooms in no, breast implants. No, I wasn't thinking about I know. his. They, they asked him. Huh? Uh, uh, we, we are concerned about it, and um, particularly now since many of the class actions that we bring are about breaches to data privacy and hacking. So if that's the problem, you know, how are we going to effectuate a, a meaningful solution for people? Um, so we use whatever safeguards we can. We are very concerned about um, private information. We were very concerned about that in Volkswagen. We needed a lot of personal information from people uh, to make sure that we were transferring vehicle ownership appropriately. Uh, and so there were elaborate safeguards for that. Um, uh, I, um, a lot of our direct communications with class members were personal communications by telephone, 
or email to email. And I think that's an important safeguard. It takes a lot of resources, it takes a lot of time and effort and work to maintain that personal level of communication. But again, I think that that's the gold standard and it's necessary and it's really the least vulnerable um, to, to, to hacking. I don't think we can depend on you know, massive uh, <coughs> digital messaging uh, in class actions or litigations to, to motivate people to do anything. So Elizabeth, uh, just, Elizabeth, just as a question, when you communicate, do you use Wicker or Signal as part of your ephemeral messaging? I am the wrong person to be asking that question to. So Harvey, what? If it's a good thing, I'm sure we do. <laughs> Let's put it this way, the litigation will demonstrate that. Yeah. Uh, Harvey, why did you ask that question about those? How many of you people in this room use Wicker or Signal in your communications? So this is for ephemeral messaging yeah. encryption. Right. The fact that the attorneys, it, it's an eight, how many of you can write an algorithm? How many of you own Bitcoin? Wait, 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 wait. How many what? O own Bitcoin. How many of you can write a computer algorithm? algorithm. Because if you could do long division, you could you do an algorithm. You can write an algorithm. That's why yeah, I but, raised my but, hand. But these issues <laughs> are quite fascinating about the legal community, but I'll wait for people to speak. But the level of lack of understanding what our adversaries want to do, because you're all great targets, is fascinating. OK. That, uh, I'll stop. That, that, that is, <laughs> Zach? Sure, thank you. Uh, thanks everyone for, for still being here and thanks to the center for inviting me. Uh, so when I was mm -hmm. asked to join this panel on MDL and technology, uh, a few ideas immediately popped into my head, uh, but it turned out that the same ideas also popped into Peter's head. And so he <laughs> invited people who can speak directly to the issues that I was gonna speak to indirectly, uh, as you'll see uh, in my comments. Uh, so the first thought I had about MDL and technology was this fantastic article I read called The Participatory Class Action, uh, which was written by Elizabeth Cabracer and Sam Azakaroff. Uh, so I'm probably not the person to summarize their arguments since they are here and can do it themselves. Uh, but I think that the big contribution, or a big contribution of that article that's relevant today is just the point Elizabeth was just making about the role of technology in communicating with clients, both courts and attorneys communicating with clients. Uh, and in MDL, as opposed to class action, we have an additional uh, piece of that puzzle, which is the communication with people who might be clients, the kind of claim generation aspect. Uh, and there, too, technology must be valuable. It must be valuable in identifying the pool of potential claimants, uh, the combination of social media and machine learning or other big data analysis to identify potential claimants uh, must be an aid to people seeking to generate claims. Uh, I'd also like to flag for people's attention because uh, yesterday Arthur Miller mentioned arbitration and that arbitration is another kind of aspect of dispute resolution we should be talking about. Uh, and I've learned a great deal about arbitration from Professor Resnick. Uh, the, there's a recent study that came out uh, by two people who are not here, so I can't share that with you, uh, by uh, Andrea Chandresker and David Horton. Uh, and they looked at vast amounts of data on arbitration. Uh, and one interesting thing that they found that's just been coming up in recent years is plaintiffs or claimants' attorneys in arbitrations uh, essentially doing what we've been talking about in this conference, aggregating. Uh, these are arbitrations where the arbitrations by contract must proceed in an individual manner. But that doesn't mean that an individual plaintiff or claimant's attorney can't bring together lots and lots of people who all have the same claims and then in mass bring these individual yet bundled arbitrations. Uh, what that does is it starts to level the playing field in terms of the economies of scale and settlement leverage that the claimants have. Uh, and so they're seeing evidence that this is happening in arbitration and although they don't say so in their paper, it must be the case uh, that technology is aiding in that process again, in the identification of potential claimants and the cheap ways of communicating with those claimants and getting them to sign up uh, into these bundles. <clears throat> now, I've said a, a few words already about the role of technology in claim generation, and I know that claim generation uh, is a bit of a four-letter word uh, for some people, uh, and that people don't like this idea about claim generation, but I'd also like to add that I think technology 
can play an important role, not just in the generation of claims, uh, but in the weeding out of bad claims, uh, or in at least the tiering of claims. That again, when you have access to more information, uh, which we get through technology, and access to much better processing power, the same technology that can identify potential claimants also might be responsive to some of those epidemiological concerns we talked about yesterday uh, and other questions in any given large uh, mass tort or other MDL about trying to quickly and cheaply identify which plaintiffs deserve what recovery, which plaintiffs are not, not reasonably part of the group. <clears throat> the kind of second aspect of technology I wanted to talk about uh, is about the role of technology in the analysis of uh, the MDL process uh, and the analysis of judicial decision making. Uh, and one of the great things about uh, data about MDL uh, and about the federal courts more generally is that it's data that's not only being collected by attorneys who are hoping to serve their client interests, uh, it's also being collected by the courts, by the FGC, FJC, the AO, the Administrative Conference, the JPML, uh, and indeed, uh, Emery, who's sitting right next to me, will tell you more about that, I'm sure. Uh, so there, too, uh, I've been preempted a bit by <laughs> Peter's excellent selection of panelists. Um, but on the point of court collection of data, uh, it seems to me that the important question is not whether the courts are collecting data, but whether those people in the positions to make decisions are actually looking at that data and making decisions in light of that data. Uh, and although I can't identify any clear examples of causation, I think there's good reason to believe that, for example, the judges on the JPML are aware of the data that's being collected about, say, which judges are selected as transferees, uh, and their behavior is changing, uh, I'm fairly uh, confident, as a result of that. And that's a good thing, uh, and that's something that I hope can continue. Uh, even just using old pencil and paper techniques, basically, uh, Andrew Brott and I, uh, building on work by Margie Williams and Tracy George, uh, have looked at decisions by the panel both in whether, whether to consolidate, uh, where to consolidate, and which judge to assign cases. Uh, and among other things, uh, we found that plaintiffs and defendants do roughly equally well at persuading the panel where to assign cases. Uh, that the judges to whom these cases are assigned are roughly representative of federal district judges overall. Uh, though there's some interesting variation if you start to cut that data in different ways, which I'm happy to discuss. Uh, but one piece of those results that I did want to mention, because I think it's responsive to a conversation we had yesterday about issues of diversity, uh, is that one thing that we found looking at MDLs consolidated between 2012 and 2017 uh, is that although overall transferee judges look a lot like federal district judges overall in terms of race and gender and political party, that if you look at new judges assigned their first MDLs, there are dramatically more women assigned their first MDL during that period uh, than you'd predict based on the general population. Mm -hmm. uh, and to me, it's not a coincidence that the panel during that period also was about 50% men and 50% women. Uh, now I have to say, we don't have such optimistic results on race, and during that period the panel was 100% white and 0% non-white, which Margie pointed out to me yesterday, describes the panel for its entire existence. Um, so all of that is to say that when you can look at these data and you can look uh, more broadly, we might be able to draw some lessons both about where MDL is and where we might want it to go. Uh, technology will only increase those capabilities. Uh, not only can we use technology to evaluate claim types, but we can engage in these more sophisticated studies of judicial behavior. Uh, Beth Birch and Margie Williams' work on the social networks uh, among plaintiffs' lawyers will only be aided by additional data. Uh, and there are ongoing projects going on with a number of scholars looking at federal docket sheets and other massive troves of data that can only really be analyzed by using these kind of high-level machine learning techniques. Uh, the other piece of that data gathering that I was hoping to mention uh, is that I think it's important that this data gathering as much as possible remains public uh, because I think there's important work that can be done with academics uh, and the media and others collaborating with courts and with lawyers in thinking through these important social problems. But Peter is doing that himself, so he too is uh, preempting my talk. 
the last thing I wanted to say is uh, on these issues of data security. Uh, and I thought it was noteworthy that when Peter asked his question to Elizabeth, she sighed quite loudly. I hope that sigh gets in the transcript. Because um, <laughs> I think that's the correct, uh, correct response. Uh, that we're talking about huge amounts of data, huge amounts of private information being shared among many, many lawyers. Now we heard from our last panel among states and localities as well, claims administrators. Uh, and, and I'll end uh, where Elizabeth started with the fax machine. Uh, which is that uh, I have a little bit of a side interest in election security. Uh, and in election security, it turns out that the state-of-the-art technology to avoid uh, hacking is the paper ballot. Uh, and so there is this tension that I spent most of my remarks talking about how I love big data, I want to collect more data, I want to be able to look at it, but of course that creates vulnerabilities and those big data collection systems have vulnerabilities that the fax machine or the paper ballot do not. Uh, so that's a hard question, which I will leave to someone uh, at a higher pay grade to answer. Emery? Okay. And I'm going to go quick because uh, I, want to, I want to save time for everyone to talk, and I could listen to everybody else talk more than I want to talk. So yesterday, Judith said the FJC is a, is a great resource, and I appreciate that comment. And Margie definitely uh, deserves it much more than me. But uh, then she kind of compared us, I thought, to a federal courthouse that's sometimes called the Taj Mahal. <laughs> I know you didn't do it, but I want to just be clear that the FJC is not the Taj Mahal. Um, we're not even a Taj. <laughs> I was going to say we're not even a T, but I was worried about, you know, the men my age, you know, we, we, we don't want to have heart attacks or anything like that. <laughs> so the FJC is cheap, and I want to, uh, there's an old joke about uh, university departments that I remember from my days as an academic, which is, the second cheapest department on campus, this is an old joke. The second cheapest department on campus is the math department, because all you need is paper, pencils, and waste paper baskets. The cheapest department's the philosophy department, because you don't need the waste paper baskets. <laughs> the FJC is a little bit like a math department, and it's a little bit like the philosophy department, and I'm going to explain that, right? So we do a lot of, uh, we do do data work, but we also do work more, I don't want to say on the prescriptive side so much, uh, but we do do um, practical, what we call practical resources for judges. I mean, everything from the manual for complex litigation, uh, resource manual on scientific evidence, down to, you know, pocket guides on specific topics. So we do a lot, we do a lot of that work, and we also do the data work, which I'm going to talk quickly about. Um, the other thing, though, I want to talk about the FJC is there's often confusion about what the FJC does and is. Again, not a Taj Mahal, kind of like a math department, kind of like a philosophy <laughs> department. This was in the news, this was in legal news line last week, and it's on meritless claims clog courts. Lawyers group calls for more teeth amending Rule 26, and it's about MDLs. And in this article, I, John, uh, I'm, I won't say the author's name, but he's not here, I'm sure. Okay. <laughs> The last, next to last paragraph of the circle says, a special advisory committee on civil rules, you're all familiar with this, under the Federal Judicial Center in Washington, D.C., is currently evaluating whether the FRCP should be updated. Well, yeah, um, I didn't, this happens to us a lot. We get the news clippings like <laughs> lots of you, and when the FJC gets cited, we're often uh, given many greater powers than we have. Uh, I think the federal, the advisory committee on civil rules would be very surprised to know that uh, they're under us. <laughs> Although I'm going to clarify that at the November meeting. Um, and we do, uh, in Zach said we collect data. The interesting thing I want to, the point, I want to make two points about data and about data projects involving MDLs. Um, one is that the FJC doesn't actually own very much data at all that we are a separate agency within the courts, and usually the data we're using comes from uh, the courts themselves uh, or comes from uh, the panel data or other actors in the system. So we don't, we have access to the data um, much greater than, than pretty much anyone else. But, I, you know, I don't have to tell a room full of law professors, you know, there are limited property rights in the data, right? You might have an easement across your neighbor's property, but you can't build a house there. Uh, I have access to the data, but usually my access is, is constrained. 
And for most projects, for us to access the, what was the term Zach used? The vast amounts of data. Uh, I'm going to need a specific request from a judicial conference committee or some kind of court unit. Um, the phrase I wrote down on my piece of paper is, I can't cowboy the data. Um, I used to be able to more, um, and I think they got wise to me. Uh, so, but now, um, you, I can't do that. So that's, that's, a, that's a very significant limit on what we can do as an agency. So if, if a court unit, if a, a conference committee comes to us and asks us to go in and, and, and look at the data in a certain way, we can do that. If they don't ask us, we, we generally can't. The other point I wanted to make, and I think this is just a step back from the conference because I really want to hear Harvey on, on security, um, is um, y'all are also in competition. Uh, again, the FJC, like I said, we're, we're cheap, we're not very big, and you're in competition uh, for projects with lots of other people. I mean, there is 60% of the civil docket that we haven't talked about. Uh, even if 40% is MDL, 60% is not, and we're talking about stuff like Social Security Disability Appeals. That's an issue that the committee's looking at. We're talking about immigration cases. Nobody talks about that. Uh, we have all that criminal stuff, and there's a whole world of bankruptcy that came up in the first panel. So there's a lot of competition. And if we look at, uh, at, at the MDL world, it's true, it's lots of cases, but how many of those uh, aggregate non-class settlements are there to analyze a year? versus how many bankruptcy cases are there, or how many pro se litigants are there. So there's competition for our resources that I think is something else that has to, has to be taken into account. I want to hear. Great. Harvey? Uh, well, thank you. Um, so I'm the last panelist on the last panel on the last day. Uh, very much like being um, Elizabeth Taylor's seventh husband on his wedding night. <laughs> you know what you're supposed to do, but the only person interested in it is probably you. But thank you for staying. So I have a long-term relation at NYU. Uh, I was a graduate here, um, in, uh, and Linda Silverman has left, but just for the record, Linda did try to teach me civil procedure. Thank you, Linda. Um, and I'm gonna give it a little bit different perspective, which is that uh, Sam mentioned the notion of collective action. So where I sit, when I show up at a conference and I don't normally go to it, it's not good for that group. Uh, because we bring a certain national security perspective. Example for numbers. Uh, you guys think $40 million is a lot to put together a plaintiff's group for the committee. Um, $40 million keeps an F-22 in the air for 80 hours. Our perspective of what numbers are is a little bit different than when you move into the civil action tort world. So why is that important? Because we see this as um, there are five ways to basically move security, national security issue at, a, at, at scale and scope that we're interested in. When I say we, it's think of DOD, USG. So that, uh, though I, all my remarks are my own, I don't represent any part of currently of my, uh, the people I represent for the record. But there are five ways. The first, it was the key way if you want to move the world on scale is use the tax code. So when we're thinking about moving the world, we're thinking about for security in this space, tax issues. The second way you move it on scale is uh, insurance premiums. The reason you have uh, the relationship of the water things in this room for structurally, and it's usually insurance and litigation that changes structure. Mm -hmm. So we're looking at how you understand cyber insurance. So cyber insurance currently in the system is sort of like a, a blind dog in a meat market. They know there's a lot of profit there, but they can't figure out how to chomp onto the meat. And that's a problem of why it's intriguing to me. Because if you look at Sam's original article, this famous seminal article, I'm sorry it has to be in the Yale a way to download it outside. But he looks at what a mature tort is. And if you look on page uh, 16, 18 of mature torts, they have three key characteristics as a phenomena. One is the market pressures and the benefits to be gained from economics of scale seem to lead to the concentration of market share on both the plaintiff and defense slide sides. You have the repeat actors, patterns of liability and damages stabilized, trials seem to become increasingly exceptional as claims are handled through the routinized negotiations. Third, uh, mature torts seem to involve grid structures for the actual treatment of accidental claims. You need the, you need the actual material. 
So when you look at his, you know, at this article, when people look at tours historically, they go through the same thing. They look at railroads, then they look at cars, then they look at your, the MDL, your asbestos issues. So I'm telling you, th the next wave has to be cybersecurity. That's the next wave of major thinking about collective action. And we're looking at see how insurance will play that role. So the third hammer that you usually use in this space is, um, um, I would say, uh, we call it uh, regulation. So that's all the way the state gets involved, both state and federal, and how they figure out what to do. You're seeing a lot of requirements now, and this requirements. You're seeing the state of California coming forward with its legislation, le leaning on what, and they're saying what they're going to hold people liable for private information. And then the fourth hammer that you're seeing now is we call international treaties. So you have the GDPR. If you're, if you're a major player in the system, if you're a multi, a Fortune 12, 15, 20, you're working in Europe, you're under that jurisdiction, that's going to be creating sort of new rules, liabilities, and issues. And then the fifth, which is the world that you guys live in, it's litigation. So we see litigation as really another one of these movements to move the issue of cyber and national security. And you have a variety of ways of doing it, so the tail end of the two panels is, um, you had Feinberg here, so Feinberg is like, I understand what you guys are doing. You started with class action, you moved to MDL, you're now moving to the next level, you're now moving to arbitration. That's where we're interested in. How do you move the system on scale and scope? We have five hammers to do it. Torts have always been one of the hammers, and we're interested in what is it really about? Like, are you looking at individualized justice anymore? Or are you performing a social collective action function for USG? So we're going to be a free rider to that individualized market system, which generates what I would call entrepreneurial attorneys, who you know as plaintiff lawyers, who are able to use this system on scale. They, it's, it's the hidden hand. You're doing something for your own self-interest, which you think is for your individualized clients. And people who step back, we want to use that capacity and capability to raise the social structure for collective action. So you're an either wittingly or unwittingly uh, agents for what we see as the important aspect of raising the bar the same way. Who is we in that sense? I would say the USG and individuals who want to be able to understand that the forefront of the most dangerous vulnerability is cybersecurity. We cannot be insured of our military platform. So I was kidding Elizabeth is that how many of you in your law firms know for a fact, or even at NYU, that when you are communicating using your wireless systems, that you're encrypting your messages? So I've scared a lot. I do a lot of consulting. I've scared a lot of CEOs. Mm -hmm. When I sit down quietly with them and say, why don't you ask your CISO, your computer information security officer, mm -hmm. are you doing that? Mm -hmm. And they go, how the hell would I know? I go, actually, sir or ma'am, you better know because that's what's taking down CEOs. Mm -hmm. So you ask how many senior partners in major law firms are now asking, do we understand how to do this? Are we locking down? Because I will tell you there's a small company outside of Chicago. They come in a room like this. They put in a little deck, it looks like a deck of cards in their USB port and they pull down every wireless mm -hmm. communication going on in this entire building. Mm -hmm. And I've said, uh, we've, we've done red teams with law firms, you just plug it in and you say to the listener, you say to the managing partner, love that email to your daughter. Yeah. Fascinating. So these communications issues are critical for what adversaries want and there's a huge market for it with that. So I think I'm happy to scare you even more, but I will step down because as you said, it's more interesting to hear what people's uh, questions will be at this point of uh, proceedings. So, Thank you. Um, first, I, I do want to open it up to the people who are here, but first, is there anybody on the panel who wants to comment on anybody else's? Uh... Last comment I make, it's all about the data. So it's kind of amusing that given, I just was with Dun & Bradstreet, you would be stunned at the databases they have on the corporate world mm -hmm. and how they sell a service that's a huge service for the corporate world to understand what their risk management is for how they interact with different corporations. And that the, the, these guys are sitting unbelievable data, but once you get the data, if you're gonna go down that road, this becomes an economic analysis about efficiency. It's unclear to me where 
justice and individual mm -hmm. rights become, you become one more arm of a market system that the legal system is now part of, as opposed to when I was at NYU thinking about the role of individual justice, it's a very different concept that the system is being used for. But the, it's all about the data. Judith? Uh, hi, Judith Resnick. I wanted to ask about the price, uh, both from the federal government in terms of PACER and access. So access fees to data, mm -hmm. the trolling, the ownership questions, uh, Emery pointed out, we were at a conference X years ago about um, that the clerk's office is, a, the clerk is the statutory owner of federal court data yeah. uh, at some level, unclear exactly how that cashes out, so to speak. Uh, but in terms of understanding, um, as all of you are looking, uh, Peter, you described to begin with the idea that you're gonna create a free database in which we can all just, I take it, plug in and learn, uh, but uh, one is how the PSCs fund what Elizabeth was talking about, two is how the feds charge and whom, and in terms of trolling, waiving access, and enabling mass use of the data that you are describing that is the inside court part. It's not everything on my cell phone, but it's a piece of it. I would say one quick response that you question raises for me. So the the, the the courts are a public good, right? We pay, taxpayers pay for the federal salaries. Why, why are there NDAs that corporate entities and plaintiffs want to agree to that then hides that information that is critical for the system? So the whole concept of the NDA being exploited for a public good that's, if you guys want an interesting issue for a conference for data selection and, and control, I find that kind of astounding, because I've been on both sides signing NDAs and negotiating them, but you feel a little bit dirty afterwards, because you know that this is a public good, and you are hiding the essential elements of what's going on inside both plaintiff and corporate America. And what's the price of the data? Yeah. Oh, I'm, I'm not sure what the actual price is per page. Um, yes. I mean, I th like Harvey said, I, my view is that everything I say today is, yeah. uh, is my opinion, even the things I say that are factual statements. You can call it fake news if you want. Um, <laughs> I, I, Judith, can I respectfully say I'm not going to, uh, I, I really want not to talk about pace or fees. Can we just, can we skip that? <laughs> uh, Remember, we want to keep him promotable through the system. Like, right. um, one of the ways around PACER fees, at least in MDLs, are those court websites. Hmm. And one of the ways around the costs of transcripts of hearings, our courts have now agreed, uh, the PSC, for in, in, in these big MDLs, for example, the PSC pays the, the court reporter. Uh, a, a negotiated market rate to produce that transcript because we want court reporters to have, be able to earn a living. We don't want people to have to pay high prices for transcripts of public proceedings. And so the way we're trying to keep the courts public is to get it online and to get it online through a trusted source, which is a court website where everything is there, it's user friendly, it's updated every day, and that's a workaround, it's a hack, around PACER. Mm. Um, one note that we, we kind of all know, but we forget, it was only within the last two years that the uh, multi-district litigation panel uh, went to e-filing. And of course, our United States Supreme Court only recently went to okay. limited uh, e-filing. So I think this is happening. And, and look, the individualized thirst for justice is never gonna go away. It needs to be honored, it needs to be promoted, but it can also be used as a lever it's reverse leverage for this collective action uh, concept because it works both ways. The need that people have for information about proceedings and issues and products and goings on that affect their lives is never gonna go away. Uh, they have more power through online communications. We have more vulnerability because everything is online in, a, in the cloud. I will not do banking online, I'm sorry. I'm a Luddite because somehow I feel it's safer if I don't do that. Maybe I'm right. You are right. Am I right? Yes. Oh, good. Um, well, I'm apparently very sophisticated in terms of my analysis of vulnerabilities Correct. from uh, cybersecurity. 
But, you know, I think these are things, you know, the fundamental things abide. And we can use, we can use technology uh, to promote them or we can just completely blow ourselves up with it. And I'll, I'll just add uh, to what Elizabeth said about some MDL courts putting some documents online. Uh, really the next phase is if there would be some group that might centralize those, some sort of center focused on civil justice uh, <laughs> that might be able to host all of those things yes. in one place yes. rather than having to go to the Eastern District of Louisiana for one and the District of Massachusetts. For well, that's exactly what, I mean, obviously, yeah. that's exactly what we're trying to do, but more than just what, the, what, what appears on the docket, but the underlying data as well. Yeah, and by the way, the FJC is a bit of a hacker as well because what they do to subvert uh, PACER and all these <laughs> unknowable case management orders of federal judges is they collect them and make them available to federal judges. Mm. Yeah, well. Yeah. <laughs> and, and members Some of service. the public who know where to go. As, adv as an advice to the legal counsel, we, just We honor, not, we just honor not, you, just masked not, man. Just <laughs> okay. Uh, so this is a maybe a little bit of an out there question, um, but the latest thing to hit the Twitter earlier this week, new app lets you sue anyone by pressing a button. So I was wondering, have any of the panelists heard about this do not pay app? Is this familiar to anyone? So I, I'm, I'm just going to read a, a quick summary and my question, so I have my own thoughts on this, but I would sort of love to hear the panel that has been anointed to tell us about uh, MDLs and technology to say what they think. A free service that launched in the iOS app store today uses IBM Watson powered artificial intelligence to help people win up to $25,000 in small claims court. Uh, so it, um, the app has a streamlined, let me see where we get to the part. Uh, the app works by having a bot ask the user a few basic questions about their legal issue. The bot then uses the answer to classify the case into one of 15 different legal areas, uh, blah, blah, blah. After that, do not pay draws up documents specific to that legal area and fills in the details. Just print it out, mail it to the courthouse, and voila, you're the plaintiff. Um, and if you have to show in, up to court in person, do not pay even creates a script for the plaintiff to read aloud in court. So. When I read this, um, my oh, first thought was obviously went to right to aggregation, uh, but instead of giving my own thoughts, I would just love to hear uh, what other people have to say about this. You should be, this, the entire legal system should be terrified of artificial intelligence. Are you consulting now? Yes, so um, the, uh, no, because, uh, you know, the experiment that was done, there was a series of briefs that were done and written, and they would look for issue spotting. And the AI beat the humans dramatically for young yeah. associates yeah. In, in the firm. Because the field is so analytical, the analytical issue is easily disposable to algorithm writing. It's, a, it's just a natural uh, think about it, the way you think about how we do it. So what is the role and function of lawyers anymore? So it's a judgment issue, but AI will probably get very good at judgment. And then the second issue is, as you know, the whole core of the, yesterday was, what is the individual causality of the individual to the res, to the thing, right? How do you not explain that? I put it to you, the more sophisticated we get with the DNA of decomposing you as a DNA and looking at exposure to the res and your particular vulnerability to res, that may be the result and science may be able to do it. So. The legal profession should be, so, I think, in a general high state of anxiety. So, Harry, uh, that's hard, Harvey, but that's okay. Harvey no, look, I just want to say that this is exactly what we're going to be talking about at the end of November uh, uh, in our AI conference. Uh, so, come. <laughs> I'm gonna, Sign up and come. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to add a couple quick things on this one because I actually met the do not pay person at a, at a similar AI conference in California, and he's a Stanford student. Um, uh -huh. and is very smart and created this originally as a way of fighting his parking tickets. Mm -hmm. um, and ha created a website where you can just enter a little bit of information and it'll, it does the same thing just for parking tickets and this is a small claims court version. The other thing is that while the how advanced AI is in making serious legal arguments may be up for debate, um, there are other companies. There's, I know there's um, a legal, a brief services legal aid company called Carpels in Chicago, which is putting together something similar for um, legal aid type stuff. 
Um, it's not super high-tech AI, but it's based on their own database of stuff that they've drawn up, where if there are similar cases that repeat, they can just enter a few bits of information and produce a new. So, so this is some parking. Have you been to Montreal recently and parked your car? I encourage you to do it. So the AI that they have is you park, you park your car, you put the money into your meter, there's a sensor there, and it says on your phone, you have 30 minutes, so be careful, because the meter person sits at what they call their Starbucks, which is Tim Hortons, and they have a list on their screen of all the parking in the, in the area. They are able to see when you're basically running over your time. They then be able to, you get on your, your iPhone a little thing, you have five more minutes left before we're gonna penalize you. The meter maid just sits there, as it bings, a thing goes out, they're raising hundreds of thousands of dollars because it's the most efficient way to handle it, pure parking AI and Montreal is doing it. It's just a question of time before smart cities start to do this. And it'll be tough to beat the ticket unless there's a problem with the algorithm. I, I'll just add that uh, I think Harvey was very careful to say that the legal profession should be anxious, uh, not say the legal system. Uh, if the problem here is that mm -hmm. people are gonna get better and cheaper access to legal services that we're gonna be able to more accurately deter wrongful behavior, you know, but th that outcome might be bad for people who are second years that I teach uh, and who are looking for jobs, but that doesn't mean that systemically the results are bad. They might be good. Hi, my name is Jacob. Um, I have uh, my question is related to the previous question regarding access to information from the courts and from parties. So I've just noticed that there's this trend of Defendants especially seeking to have their documents um, filed under seal, basically barred from access to everyone who isn't directly a party to the proceedings or who doesn't need the information for some other very important reason. So my question is, how does that trend, if it is a trend, how does that impact not only access to the information by the general public, but also to individuals such as yourself who need the information for all sorts of data and processing and statistics and so on. Thank you. Is that, is that for me? Is that for me? To the panel. Okay. Anyone who has any views on it? Well, they, I agree that is a problem, and in, in, in just along with my, gen, my general remarks, we, if, if something is sealed, I can't see it either, oh. just to be clear. I mean, I don't, that's, that's it. In fact, we had a, a policy discussion one time, and that's always been the rule, and we were negotiating a new data access policy, and that was one of the things on the table, and I, I told the negotiators, I said, well, give that, you know, if they want, to, if they want something, you give that, because we never had that. So um, I, don't, I don't have a good answer about the trend. I, I know lots of stuff is filed, uh, you know, under seal uh, in lots of different cases. Anybody yeah. else? Well, I, I I struggle with this because, uh, first of all, logistically, it is a hassle uh, to file uh, briefs yes, and pleadings uh, uh, that, inv that include uh, confidential information. You have to file a redacted version. Uh, the filing under seal process is difficult and is prone to error and mistake. Uh, we have all seen in major litigation uh, documents that were supposed to have been filed under seal all of a sudden so all of a sudden show up on e-filing, even for a few minutes, publicly, before somebody corrects the issue. I do believe in disclosure. I think courts are right to distrust uh, confidentiality and, and to weigh in favor of, of public disclosure and to put the burden on the party seeking uh, to keep information private or confidential. But I don't think I want to see a pure, uh, you know, 100% everything is public you know, if the litigant needs to see it or analyze it, then the public gets it. And the reason that I say that is because I'm one of those old school people that believes that disruption can sometimes be a bad thing. <laughs> and, you know, we're dealing in a world of decisions that are made uh, on behalf of publicly traded uh, corporations, um, information that has to be analyzed, information that has to be uh, taken into, into context, and the legal system uh, uses a discovery process that builds in time to do that and, and shields some information, uh, at least from immediate public view. So it's a complicated issue. I just don't think the solution is let's just make everything uh, public 
right away, and I say that in part because uh, I think that's the only issue I, I agree with both Justices mm -hmm. Scalia and uh, Kagan on, which is that privacy is a thing and it's a right and we, we still have it. So I would just jump in, Nora Engstrom from Stanford, and I would just jump in here to answer that question, which is, I think this is a place where academics actually have a very useful role, which is stuff is filed under seal. Sometimes it genuinely should be. Sometimes the parties do it by consent, and they're just, you know, no one really wants the fight. Uh, and so it's easier to do it by, by consent. The judge wants to go along because he sui sponte is not going to create a fight. But academics can intervene in cases and get cases, you know, or get filings unsealed. And I've done that numerous times to get, you know, useful information in the public eye. It's actually really easy to do, and I think it's a valuable service that academics and journalists can both play. David, I think we have uh, time for one more question. Uh, this this is on the Volkswagen thing that came up. Uh, as it happens, uh, my son, who is a software engineer, so he's very sophisticated, he lives in California, and he had a Volkswagen diesel, and apparently he went online and there were like two or three different systems, so he was able, to, California apparently had their own system, which was separate from the, the other system, and then there was, there was a third system that was sort of that he got through the dealers, so that so how did the how did the litigants sort all this out, or do you just leave it up to the individual, which is, seems to be what happened in this case? And my son picked the best deal, which was that under the California deal, they bought back the car for what he had originally paid for it, uh, which seemed like a pretty good deal because he'd already driven it for a couple of years, but. Right. Uh, I'm just wondering how the how the uh, how this was sorted out or wasn't it sorted out? Yeah, the, you just the, left it to the individual. No, the deal was the deal was the same. Um, the 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 deal terms were uniform with respect to all consumers, but because Volkswagen was a combination of separate set, separate yet coordinated settlements involving the Department of Justice, the Environmental Protection Agency, the Federal Trade Commission. Uh, and the California, uh, the California AG, uh, which, which became part of the MDL, and then the multi-state group, um, there were different sources of information. Um, the court and the parties tried very hard to make sure that uh, the information was consistent, but because different federal and state agencies are invol were involved using different terminology, um, it was sometimes expressed in different terms. Now, the bad news about that was there was a little bit of consumer confusion that's why we had a hotline and we basically mm -hmm. walked people through the deal uh, and got them their money. The good news about that is with respect to the monitoring uh, aspect of this and enforcement, because there were multiple government agencies, uh, as well as the class, who were actively monitoring uh, compliance by Volkswagen. They were monitoring uh, consumer concerns, consumer questions. You know, we had one of these uh, frequently asked question systems that was mm -hmm. renewed frequently in real time because the questions people were actually asking about the process weren't always the same as what we thought uh, they would be asking. And then we had a weekly uh, call that we did with folks from the California AG's office, with the Federal Trade Commission, with various people just to make sure that what we were seeing coming in and the questions and concerns um, we were addressing in essentially the same way. And then the court had a claims <coughs> review process where if somebody couldn't get through the system or was totally confused or uh, the Volkswagen was unresponsive or there was a one-off problem that the settlement just didn't address, they could go to claims review and, and, and get it done. So there were, there were multiple ways of getting it done. If I had it to do over, and I think uh, everyone agrees uh, in the follow-on Fiat Chrysler litigation, we're basically going to conflate um, those multiple sources uh, into single source so that everyone is seeing um, the same information in the same typeface through the same means, and it'll simplify the process. But we were basically inventing, uh, you know, uh, no one had ever done a buyback of that scale. Those government agencies had never cooperated or coordinated with each other before in that way, so uh, it, was a, it was an experiment. So thank you very much, Mr. Yeah. Panel. Uh, before I say goodbye, I just want to uh, uh, 
thank two people in particular uh, uh, who made this uh, conference as, uh, run as smoothly as it uh, did. And uh, one is uh, David Sifford, who is the research <laughs> coordinator at, uh, at the center. And the other uh, is, Shirley still, is, is Shirley Dang, who's outside. I hope you say goodbye to her when you leave. And also, by the way, uh, sign out if you have, uh, uh, if you want CLE uh, credit. But Shirley did an amazing amount of work and she should be thanked. So, uh, and uh, thank you to all of you for coming and have a nice rest of the day.